Good morning, everyone, and welcome to PECO's second quarter 2023 earnings conference call. All participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star and then one on your touchtone telephones. To withdraw your questions, you may press star and two. Please also note today's event is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to Kathy Yao, Vice President of Investor Relations. Kathy, you may begin. Good morning, and thank you for joining Petco's second quarter 2023 earnings conference call. In addition to the earnings release, there is a presentation and infographic available to download on our website at ir.petco.com, summarizing our results. On the call with me today are Ron Coughlin, Petco's Chief Executive Officer, and Brian LaRose, Petco's Chief Financial Officer. Before they begin, I would like to remind everyone that on this call, we will make certain forward-looking statements, which are subject to a number of risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from such statements. These risks and uncertainties include those set out in our earnings materials and our SEC filing. In addition, on today's call, we will refer to certain non-GAAP financial measures. Reconciliations of these measures can be found in our earnings release, presentation, and our SEC filing. And finally, during the Q&A portion of today's call, we ask that you please keep to one question and one follow-up. With that, let me turn it over to Ron. Thank you, Kathy, and welcome, everyone. Before I begin, I want to thank our 29,000 Petco partners for their enduring commitment to providing the very best for pets and pet parents. I'm proud of the work our teams deliver every single day. This morning, I'd like to focus my remarks on three key topics. First, I'll briefly review our Q2 results. Second, I'll discuss actions that will generate approximately $150 million in savings from a combination of run rate cost efficiencies and productivity enhancements by the end of fiscal 2025. These will help drive both gross margin and OPEX with a greater weighting to gross margin. And finally, I'll outline the continued progress we're making on our roadmap for accelerated profitable growth. For the quarter, we delivered solid top-line growth. Net revenue was up 3% year-over-year at $1.5 billion. Comparable sales driven by standout results in services and sustained momentum in average basket trends also grew 3%. This translated to 7% growth on a two-year stack. Our services business once again delivered exceptional performance, growing 17%, and is now over a $700 million run rate business. Our veterinary business continues to scale, and both vet and grooming are capturing more market share. And our consumables business continues its solid growth trajectory. We believe the strength of our differentiated pet health and wellness offering and the value proposition of our unique 360-degree ecosystem and omni-channel delivery model is the right one to capture the long-term megatrends of humanization and premiumization and are fundamental pillars of our long-term strategy. While we demonstrated our ability to grow, we recognize that we're operating in a tougher consumer discretionary environment than we forecasted as we entered the year. And as a result, we're not yet where I want us to be in translating top line growth to the bottom line. Our supplies and companion animal businesses remain more pressured than anticipated, impacting our profitability for the year relative to our expectations. With food, we also continue to see a bifurcation among pet parents with ongoing migration to more premium foods on the one hand and an uptick in value-seeking behaviors amongst the second cohort. Due to the broader discretionary environment and its associated impact on our supplies and penny animal businesses, as well as the pricing actions we're undertaking to ensure we're price competitive on key products and SKUs, we are revising our adjusted EBITDA and adjusted EPS guide for the year. Brian will provide more color on our expectations shortly. We remain relentlessly focused on controlling our controllables to optimally navigate today's consumer dynamics. We have a focused plan to deliver our revised targets while we continue to make progress against our long-term strategic priorities. First, we're taking additional actions to protect profitability. We are implementing tight cost controls and programmatic initiatives across the business. Through a comprehensive cost and efficiency program, we've identified and are actively working multiple areas to unlock $150 million in run rate cost savings 
by the end of fiscal 2025, of which we project $40 million in savings by the end of year one. Specifically, over the last year, including in Q2, we adjusted our workforce, reducing our corporate and field leadership headcount by a cumulative total of approximately 25%, including the closure of open roles. As a leadership team, we are acutely aware of the impact these actions have on colleagues that we care deeply about. We did not take these decisions lately. While difficult, they are best for our business, ensures our workforce matches the capability needed to support our long-term strategy. These actions position us as a leaner and more effective organization. Beyond this year, we've identified broader programmatic initiatives to further enhance profitability. These include refinements to our supply chain, including shipping and distribution enhancements, such as automation, meaningful GNA efficiencies, and improvements in merchandise operations. Brian will elaborate further. We're confident these actions will better position us for the short, medium, and long term, while enabling us to prioritize capital allocation on our key initiatives of VET, digital, and debt reduction. Turning to the second component of our strategic actions, we'll strengthen our positioning with pet parents with the surgical use of assortment, value, in-store experience, and marketing. We are actively evolving our assortment to align with the trends that we're seeing, supplementing our rapidly growing premium offerings with more value-based options. This includes reintroducing the number one selling cat food brand, Fancy Feast, this week, something both our customers and pet care center teams are very excited about, as well as Diamond Naturals. Both will drive incremental customers to the franchise. More to come here. We will complement the product moves with targeted pricing actions to address competitive gaps in key traffic driving brands and SKUs. We have taken similar actions several times throughout my tenure here, and they have delivered customers, unit, and revenue growth with break-even impact to margin within a year and accretion thereafter. Additionally, once again, we delivered margin expansion within services and digital, and we expect those to continue to help offset mixed pressures. As we ensure we have the right products at the right price for the right customer, we'll also lean into seasonal programs like Halloween and holiday. And we recently brought back our popular supplies perks program to stimulate additional supplies purchases. And we'll continue to enhance the customer experience, whether it's online, on the app, or in store. Our investments into labor continue to pay off with partner retention up nearly 800 basis points year over year. Combined, we believe these actions should meaningfully accelerate our capability to drive profitable growth and deliver for our customers. And we'll do this without compromising on progress against our differentiating long-term strategic priorities. Now, turning to the results of the quarter across services, our differentiated merchandise mix, and omni-channel. In the quarter, our total pet seen in vet increased 26% year over year. We ended Q2 with 269 hospitals and are on track to approach 300 hospitals by year end. As our hospitals mature, our economics become increasingly attractive. Vetco clinics continue to outperform our expectations and remain complementary to our hospital business. These mobile clinics up 23% year over year to a total of 1,400 clinics a week support routine wellness visits in an affordable way. They also remain a source of talent for our full-time vets with 21% of our full-time vet recruits this year coming from our clinic pool. In total, we brought 364 vets into our ecosystem in Q2, up 59% year over year, including vets available for our clinic business. In grooming, revenue growth was strong, and we continue to gain market share in a fragmented market, up nearly 100 basis points year over year, growing basket, transactions, and center store sales. Grooming's continued momentum has been accelerated by a clean grooming launch earlier this year, with services and products free of parabens, phthalates, and chemical dyes, as well as a nearly 500 basis point year-over-year -year improvement in groomer retention. In merchandise, our key challenge is in the supplies business, which was down 9% in the quarter. Categories like apparel, crates, and toys remain soft as consumers slowed spending in these products. We are taking targeted actions in this area to drive performance, including improving price competitiveness, screening the offering to more value-oriented initiatives, and expect stabilization over time. We remain nimble in our response to capturing opportunities when they arise. 
As a result of the extreme heat, we were able to drive our flea and tick business, leading to RX sales up nearly 20% year over year. As we look to the back half of the year, our supplies offerings will benefit from lower input costs and lower freight expense, particularly in Q4. Looking beyond this, Consumables remained solid. In the quarter, consumables grew 7%, with strength in both premium, up 8% year-over-year, and non-premium, up 4% year-over-year. Specifically, we continue to see strong fresh frozen growth, with 10% revenue growth and 12% customer growth year-over-year. And these are some of our highest-value customers. Our delivery model continues to be a differentiator for Petco, meeting the needs of pet parents who prefer to shop in an omni-channel fashion. Across the business, we saw 2% brick-and-mortar growth and 9% digital growth, driven by strength in basket trends and nest pack growth. Our repeat delivery and BOPIS revenue continued to grow, as did same-day delivery orders, supporting our value proposition as an integrated omnichannel player. Looking ahead, we will continue to optimize investments across all our marketing channels, in-store and online. Specifically, we will tighten the focus of our marketing dollars on driving traffic to capture share and propel profitable growth. This will include deepening our relationships with our existing 25 million customers so that we are well positioned for the eventual recovery in discretionary. A key lever here is our valuable Vital Care Premier program, where members grew 75,000 to 660,000 in the quarter. These high value customers spend more than triple what non members spend. Lap supplies trips contributed to a modest 60,000 total customer decline. And finally, as we think about increasing customer touch points, we were proud to announce the expansion of our Lowe's Shop and Shop partnership this quarter, expanding to 300 locations, including 75 of Vetco clinics. This furthers our footprint in rural markets at zero capital outlay from Petco. These locations are already performing ahead of expectations. We expect the partnership to be incrementally positive to our top line, dollar accretive to our profit, and will enable us to capture new customers. As I close, I'm proud of the progress Petco has made over the last five years, including our vet build-out and the evolution of our 360-degree omni-channel model. That said, I am not satisfied with where we are, and we have an aggressive plan across product, price competitiveness, marketing, and store and digital experience to ensure we deliver. I'm confident that we have the right blue-chip team to execute this plan, and the actions we outlined today will forge an even stronger business. Thank you. And with that, I'll hand it over to Brian. Thanks, Ron. And good morning, everyone. To build on Ron's remarks, I also want to extend my thanks to our Petco partners and their continued dedication to the health and wellness of pets. For the quarter, net revenue was $1.5 billion, an increase of 3% year over year. Comparable sales, driven by sustained strength and average basket trends, grew 3% year over year and 7% on a two-year stack. Our digital business showed strength with 9% year-over-year growth in the quarter. Total services grew 17% year-over-year, driven by the strength in vet and grooming under the leadership of our exceptional services team and is now a $700 million-plus run rate business. In merchandise, consumables were up 7% year-over-year in the quarter, while our discretionary supplies and companion animals businesses experienced ongoing softness down 9% year-over-year. Moving down the P&L, gross profit was roughly flat year-over-year year in the second quarter at $593 million. Q2 gross margin of 38.7% was down 140 basis points year-over-year. Year. The decline was primarily attributable to business mix shift with strength in services and digital and continued softness in discretionary categories. As a reminder, in services, our labor sits in cost of sales, so while services has a lower gross margin than enterprise, in the long term, it's helpful to adjust it EBITDA. In Q2, SG&A as a percentage of revenue increased 40 basis points year over year to 37.2%, driven primarily by an increase in stock-based compensation and one-time costs primarily related to headcount reduction. Excluding stock-based compensation and one-time costs this quarter, our SG&A as a percentage of revenue would have decreased 50 basis points year over year. We also had a tangible increase in payroll expense from the one-time step-up we made to a $15 per hour minimum wage last December as we continue to invest in our partners, 
a move that is increasing retention. Q2 adjusted EBITDA was $113 million, down 15.7% from prior year, with an adjusted EBITDA margin rate of 7.4%, down 170 basis points year over year. Q2 adjusted EPS was $0.06, cents, a decrease of $0.10 cents from the prior year, driven in part by a $0.04 cent year-over-year increase in interest expense based on 267 million weighted average fully diluted shares and a normalized effective tax rate of 26%. Turning to our balance sheet, our liquidity position remains strong. We ended the quarter with $619 million, inclusive of $173 million in cash and cash equivalents, and $446 million of availability on our revolving credit facility. In Q2, we paid down $25 million in principal and another $15 million last week. Year-to-date, we have now paid down $75 million toward our target debt paydown of $100 million for the year. Our CapEx of $52 million was down 26% year-over-year as we lapped last year's freezer build-out. I also want to touch on inventory briefly. Overall, we remain pleased with our inventory performance with in-stock improvements for the quarter and inventory turnover cycle remaining strong. Our inventory dollars are down 7% year-over-year. We generated free cash flow of $45 million in the quarter, up $72 million year-over-year, underscoring our enduring focus on steering this business strategically through this environment. Year to date, we've generated a total of $20 million in free cash flow, a $56 million improvement to a loss of $36 million in the first six months of 2022. As I turn to our outlook, although our long-term strategy focused on the mega trends of humanization and premiumization remains, we also acknowledge that discretionary pressures remain and consumers are more value sensitive during this environment. To address this, we are implementing strategic actions that will better position us for profitable growth in 2024 and beyond. Given the current consumer dynamics outlined above and the expected timing of benefits from our strategic cost actions, which will primarily start to benefit in 2024, we are lowering our adjusted EBITDA, adjusted EPS, and capital expenditures outlook for fiscal 2023. We've updated our guidance to Revenue of 6.15 to 6.275 billion, which is unchanged. Adjusted EBITDA of 460 to 480 million. Interest expense of 145 to 155 million, which is unchanged. Adjusted EPS of 24 cents to 30 cents on 269 million weighted average fully diluted shares. 215 million to 225 million of capital expenditures. And we continue to expect to add a total of 50 to 55 own vet hospitals in 2023 and approximately 10 rural locations. Our updated adjusted EBITDA guide anticipates continued pressure on gross margins, given continued mixed pressures away from discretionary, along with strategic pricing actions we are undertaking to accelerate growth and retention, which we have seen positive returns on in prior iterations. When the discretionary environment stabilizes, coupled with the outcome of our cost actions and productivity, we expect our gross margins will stabilize. Importantly, we've seen continued improvement in services and e-com gross margins. As a reminder, on services, the P&L geography of labor sits in cost of sales, which means the business has a lower gross margin than enterprise. Our lower CapEx guide still anticipates the build-out of our VET and rural locations as provided in the updated guidance. Beyond this year, we have identified additional programmatic initiatives to drive efficiencies and further reduce costs, which includes merchandise, supply chain, and broader G&A opportunities. These sum to an estimated $150 million on a run rate basis by the end of fiscal 2025 and an estimated 40 million run rate savings in year one, split across the following. In supply chain, we expect to further streamline our DCs and optimize our network on the first leg of our long-term distribution strategy. We are working to further optimize our routes and automate our DCs so that we can ship more efficiently from DCs to stores. We also have additional opportunities to further drive down e-com shipping costs. In merchandise, we plan to extract additional savings by right-sizing input costs from our vendors. In GNA, we will continue to optimize labor within our PCCs through leveraging technologies such as our handheld Zebra devices to assist in tasking and inventory management. Additionally, for certain roles, we are shifting our resources to lower cost locations. And of course, 
We plan to remain tactical across real estate, marketing, and other opportunities. We're confident these actions better position us for the short, medium, and long term, while allowing us to prioritize capital allocation on our key initiatives of debt, digital, and debt reduction. To conclude, the entire PECO leadership team and I remain focused on navigating the short term through disciplined execution in this environment. We are committed to adapting and evolving our business thoughtfully to meet the current cyclical impacts to pet parents and our business, while remaining well-positioned for the long term and delivering profitable growth as a leader in the resilient and secularly favorable pet category. Thank you for your time, and with that, we'd be happy to take your question. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we'll begin the question and answer session. You may ask a question by pressing star and then one on a touchstone telephone. If you are using a speakerphone, we do ask that you please pick up your handset prior to pressing the keys to ensure the best sound quality. To withdraw your questions, you may press star and two. Once again, we do ask that you please limit yourselves to one question and a single follow-up. And please also note that if you are having trouble joining the queue, we ask that you please hang up and dial back in. Once again, that is star and then one to join the question queue. We'll pause momentarily to assemble the roster. Our first question today comes from Oliver Wintermantle from Evercore ISI. Please go ahead with your question. Uh, great, thanks. Um, Brian, maybe that's, that's uh, the first question for you. Um, uh, looking like the, the uh, decrease in, in just EBITDA margin, EPS, but top line uh, uh, stays the same. So is that just a, a continued mix shift to more of the consumables away from uh, supplies in the second half? If you could maybe talk a little bit about, about the seasonality um, in that. And then um, the second part is... So is the reduction in EBITDA just uh, based on gross margin, or do you see also uh, SG&A pressures? Thank you. Hi, hey, Ollie. Thanks for the question. Uh, let me start on a macro basis. Uh, we continue to see consumers' wallets shift towards services with uh, some uncertainty moving forward. Specific to us, our initial full-year guidance assumed a modest stabilization in discretionary spend on a dollar basis in the back half of the year. And we have not seen that discretionary spend stabilize. And as a result, these factors have continued to further uh, pressure gross margins. So specific to your question, yes, the reduction in the EBITDA guide is directly related to the change in our outlook for the discretionary categories, companion animal and supplies. And the vast majority of that reduction is related to gross margin. Now, we do have cost actions in place. The team is energized. We're already getting some quick wins from those cost actions. While they'll primarily benefit 2024 and 2025, there will be some modest benefit in 2023. And the majority of those actions impact gross margin. Correct. Thanks very much. Good luck. Thanks, Oliver. Our next question comes from Zach Fidem from Wells Fargo. Please go ahead with your question. Hey guys, this is David Lanson for Zach. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, you noted that you're taking price increases to be more, or excuse me, price actions to be more competitive. Curious if you could talk about what side of the business that's coming on and, and how your discretionary pricing stacks up with peers. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, from a competitive standpoint, we can't really elaborate from a pricing standpoint. We can say the consumers today are looking for value. Um, we're taking actions to drive that value, customer engagement, drive units. Um, historically, when we've, when we've taken these actions, as Brian cited, we've seen a break even within the year, um, but it's really to address gaps in key product categories uh, that drive both traffic and pricing perception. That's helpful. And then the guide implies flat to down comps and 2H. So just curious if you could talk through the rationale there and, and maybe the trajectory of, of the business as we exited the quarter. Yeah, um, you're right. If, if you look at the overall revenue guidance, I, you know, I'll go back to macro. We continue to see pressure on consumers' wallets, especially in discretionary. And overall, we did see growth in the first half with continued momentum in services and consumables primarily. But that discretionary category remains pressured. So given that environment, we felt like maintaining our revenue guide was most appropriate. Got it. Thanks. 
Our next question comes from Simeon Gutman from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead with your question. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask what's assumed for discretionary companion for rest of the year if there's a mixed percentage. And as you plan for 24, are you just taking the tact of being extra conservative or should that category flatten out and grow for next year? Yeah, let me start, Simeon, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Ron to talk about 2024. So as, as I said earlier, our initial guide assumes some stabilization in that, in that discretionary category. If you look at Q2, we declined 9%. If you look at Q1, we were down 8%. Obviously, our expectations in Q2 weren't in line with what we previously assumed. While I won't get into a specific number, I think if you look at the minus 9 in Q2, we have not assumed much recovery from that for the balance of the year. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Ron to talk about 24. Yeah, hi, Simeon. Um, the current projections for the overall category for 24 are mid-single digit um, with a stabilization of supplies. Um, when in 24 that happens, um, we will see, but we're not, uh, we're not waiting. Um, we're going to take actions. Uh, we're taking actions on our supplies perks, which actually uh, enrollments are up 11% versus uh, when we ran that before. We're taking action on costs. We have favorable cost progress on our supplies. We have favorable freight, which allows us to have more flexibility in terms of providing value to customers. So we're taking actions. Category call for 24 at this point is mid-single digits with a stabilization in supplies. Thanks. Um, if I can ask one follow-up, I don't know if I can. On the promotionality of the industry, seems like it's it's ticking up. I'm curious how you describe it, and as you plan second half, is that is I guess I don't know if pricing actions is discounting or promotions or it's price optimization. Yeah, good question. Um, supply and demand are um, have rebalanced versus a year ago, so the industry is returning to pre-pandemic promotional levels. There's a consumer who's looking for more value, and we're making sure that we provide it. Um, and the promotions that we run are traffic positive, revenue driving, and for the most part, profit dollar neutral. So it is a effective tool in generating customers. We've seen um, positive reactions to them, but it's really a return to pre-pandemic promotional levels based upon supply now being more in balance with demand. Okay. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Thanks, Simeon. Our next question comes from Anna Andriva from Needham and Company. Please go ahead with your question. Um, great. Thanks so much. Good morning, guys. I wanted to follow up on the sales cadence that you saw during the quarter. Uh, I think you had said previously uh, that May was more in line with 1Q, so that's mid-single digits. Uh, so should we think both June and July slowed? And what are you seeing in the business so far in August? And then I had a follow-up as well. Hi, Anna. Uh, thanks for the question. In terms of linearity, we had non-comp noise with events shifting from month to month versus a year ago. What I can say is we weren't happy with supplies in May, June, or July, which is driving our guidance change. Service remained strong across all three months, and food showed solid growth across the quarter. In terms of August, um, you know, we, we haven't seen a significant change in our trend line, uh, but we're taking action and we're seeing some initial green shoots on some of those actions. Okay, great. That's, that's helpful. And just as a follow-up on gross margins, uh, did that come in line with your expectations for the quarter and just any color that you could share on the puts and takes on the gross margin line as implied by the annual guide? I think, Ron, you had mentioned uh, some of the benefits from the cost actions on a gross margin uh, starting to trickle in uh, this year as well. Yeah, I can take that one on. A, um, so in terms of gross margin, relatively in line with our, with our expectations overall, and that was despite the discretionary category not coming in in line with our expectations. So the, the, the change of the guide, as we mentioned, is primarily related to our renewed expectations on that supplies and discretionary category. On the cost actions, uh, Ron did mention that they are heavily weighted towards gross margin, but the benefits of those cost actions will mostly benefit 2024 and 2025. Some of the benefits in 2023 are more on the SG&A line from some of the headcount actions that we've taken. All right. Fair, fair enough. Thanks so much, Dave. Thanks, Anna. 
Our next question comes from Stephen Forbes from Guggenheim. Please go ahead with your question. Good morning, Ron Bryan. Ron, you mentioned premium consumables up eight, and I think non-premium up four. Uh, but given some of the comments you've made about assortment and, and just the consumer in general, curious if you provide unit volume color between those two subcategories and how you're thinking about the current mix of the business from a, a go-to-market strategy. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, we continue to see a bifurcation in demand. We're still seeing strong growth on premium offerings like Fresh Frozen, Origin, Acana, which continue to be our performing. That said, at the category level, we do see an increase in value-seeking behaviors amongst a sub-segment. We've supplemented our value offers like our launch of Fancy Feast and Diamond Naturals with price points that are appealing to our customers. Um, and additionally, the cost enhancements on supplies and related freight will be weaved in in the second half to allow us to be more cost competitive on those products as well. So it's really a, a story of bifurcation, um, strong demand on the high end and increased demand on the value side as well. Maybe just a, a quick follow-up for Brian to level set uh, capital spending expectations. Can you expand on where you're deprioritizing capital spending this year with the, the most recent change and then any comment on sort of initial 2024 plans as it pertains to balancing sort of your strategic growth initiatives with other investment needs like automation uh, to, to capture some of the savings that you noted? Yeah, good question, Steve. Uh, first, let me, let me address 2023. So we've maintained our, that target of 50 to 55 hospitals in, in 2023 and our small town rural build out of about 10. And we've also maintained our commitment to pay down $100 million of debt this year in terms of our capital allocation priorities. We're already at 75. We did 25 in Q2. We did another 15 last week. So already 15 in Q3 gets us to 75. In terms of 2024, I don't expect those capital allocation priorities to change dramatically. Uh, we will continue to focus on debt pay down. We will continue to lean into areas like VET and other strategic priorities with high ROI. The, the adjustment of the CapEx guide for this year did not trade off any of those strategic priorities. It was in other ancillary areas where we were able to make some trade-offs to maintain our cash balance and make sure we were managing our working capital appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question. Our next question comes from Seth Basham from Wedbush Securities. Please go ahead with your question. Thanks a lot and good morning. Uh, my question is just trying to better understand some of the merchandising and price changes that you're making. You know, first, uh, you know, supplies typically aren't traffic driving. So what's leading you to the decision to have to invest in price and supplies? And then secondly, you know, bringing back things like Fancy Feast and the Supplies Perks Program, why were those removed uh, in the first place? Uh, thanks for the question, Seth. Uh, so let me let me bifurcate. We didn't um, we didn't provide um, indication of where we're taking pricing. Um, what we find is <clears throat> food is a traffic driver, similar to the grocery model, and that can drag supplies. There are certain categories that are um, price perception defining within supplies, which is why we're encouraged by the fact that we have lower costs flowing through and lower freight costs coming through. Um, and those categories are strategic in terms of creating a price perception, which then would, uh, partic would uh, contribute to, uh, to traffic. Okay, that's helpful. And then the decision to you know, remove fancy fees previously in the supplies per program, can you give us some context there? Um, on Fancy Feast, we took a decision uh, back in 2018 around artificial ingredients. Uh, the Fancy Feast products that are brought into our uh, stores today are, have been reformulated and have eliminated all artificials, uh, which is a really positive thing. It's a win for Nestle. It's a win for us and a win for our customers. We're really excited about it. And Fancy Feast is absolutely a great traffic driver. Yeah, and on the supplies for our program, Seth, we tend to pulse in and out of those programs based on our expectations for elasticity and demand. And so that was not dormant for very long, and we, we, tend, we just made the decision to pulse back in. Thank you. Thanks, Seth. Our next question comes from Michael Lasser from UBS. Please go ahead with your question. Good morning. Thanks a lot for taking my question. So Petco's adjusted EBITDA margin for this year 
is now expected to be around 200 basis points below the level it was in 2019. As you diagnose why that is, what's changed about the business to, to drive such significant margin compression? How much of it relates to external factors like increased competition? And how does all of this inform your view of what the company's long-term EBITDA margin outlook is? Yeah, thanks for the question, Michael. Um, so the, the change from 2019 is primarily related to the cyclical pressure that we have in the discretionary business. That pressure has a direct impact on gross margin. That gross margin impact has a direct impact on adjusted EBITDA. We're confident that that cyclical impact will stabilize. When that stabilizes, coupled with our cost actions, we're confident that gross margin will stabilize. We do have $150 million of cost actions in play to help return EBITDA to profitable growth in the future. If you look at the impact on gross margin as well, I'll remind you that services sits labor for services sits in cost of sales. If you take services out of our model in the quarter, our gross margin would actually have been a little bit over 41%. So as services has grown materially from 2019, up 17% again in Q2, that has an impact on rate on the gross margin line. It's really a story of discretionary. And given that's our highest profit category, the cyclical pressure of discretionary on the P&L. Okay. Um, my follow-up question is on uh, the comp outlook, especially as you head into the holidays. You know, I, I, what are you assuming as, as your base case for 3Q, 4Q comps, you know, especially given the uncertain macroeconomic environment? And you know, what, what would drive upside and what would drive downside to those comp expectations? Yeah, I'm not going to get into the quarters, Michael, but I'll tell you that we felt like the revenue, maintaining the revenue guide was the most appropriate thing to do, given some of that uncertainty. We'd expect uh, that services would continue to be strong. We're happy with our consumables performance this quarter up 7%, but that discretionary category remains under pressure. So if you look at the back half of the year, um, that would imply, as, as somebody uh, asked earlier, a somewhat of a deceleration in comp. We felt like that was the best guide based on what we know today. Thank you very much, and good luck. Thank you. Our next question comes from Steven Zacone from City. Please go ahead with your question. Great. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. So um, to follow up on Michael's question, what do you think is the optimal mix of discretionary for this business? Because on the one hand, yes, it's challenging from a cyclical perspective, but on the other hand, some of your growth drivers in the business since you've come public, right, are premiumization and food and then services, which are lower gross margin rate businesses. So I'm curious for what's the optimal mix of discretionary over time. And if it continues to trend lower, how do you think about the margin drivers to improve EBITDA margin rate over the next couple of years? Thanks for the, thanks for the question. Um, we like our uh, discretionary business, our supplies business, companion animal business, they are high margin businesses. So outside of a uh, economic cycle like the one we're in, they help drive our strong profitability uh, and our customer delighters. And we have differentiation for our, for our, from our own brands. And in that category, actually, uh, roughly 50% plus is own brands. So it is a very attractive profit driver for us on a timeless basis. Um, as you cited, um, things like digital, things like services are um, gross margin dilute, dilutive, um, but in both those cases, we are driving margin enhancements within those silos, which help offset that. And as Brian has cited, from a services standpoint, um, gross margin uh, is impacted by the, the labor. If you look at it on an EBITDA basis in the mid to long term, uh, it's equivalent to roughly equivalent to our total enterprise. Okay, but to follow up on that then, so if we think about the vet hospital side of the business right now, which is getting some scale, can you say whether that's EBITDA margin accretive to the business today? Will it be EBITDA margin accretive in the next couple of years? Thank you. Yes, yeah, Steve, thanks for the question. Uh, today it is not. 
So if you think about the VET model, the great news about the VET model is the unit economics continue to track along or along with or ahead of our model, depending on the cohort. Our most recent cohorts are ahead of model. That model has uh, EBIT, uh, EBITDA dollars in, and gross margin dollars as dilutive in the first year, roughly break even in year two on a path to 20% EBITDA in year five. We're on track with that. If you look at our o- overall cohorts, we have 269 hospitals. We've added you know, roughly 150 to 175 of those in the last two plus years, which means the average age of our hospital is just over two years, meaning the average EBITDA rate of those hospitals is just over that break-even amount. Now, the, the good news with that is they are maturing. As those hospitals mature, the, host, the VET model will be accretive to our overall model and at that inflection point become actually accretive to the overall enterprise EBITDA rate. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star and then one. To withdraw your questions, you may press star and two. Our next question comes from Greg Somers from Gordon Haskett. Please go ahead with your question. I just wanted to follow up on the uh, vets. I was wondering if you're still seeing uh, in-store, like center store lift from the vets that is similar uh, to past quarters. And then is that mainly traffic driven? And then just a follow up, uh, what was the biggest bucket out of that 150 million savings uh, of the various buckets that you laid out? Thank you. Thanks for the uh, question, Greg. So uh, from a vet standpoint, we really like the impact it has on the rest of uh, the store. So. Uh, from a center store lift standpoint, we've revalidated the four to five point lift on center store uh, when we put in a vet, which has is a great impact. Uh, our locations with vets are growing tangibly faster than the locations without vets. Uh, and in terms of traffic, yes, it is a, a very effective traffic driver for us. In fact, 15% of the vet customers are new to Petco. So that's one of the advantages from uh, from that model. Yeah, and on the cost actions, the the larger buckets of the cost actions are in merchandise and supply chain, which will impact the gross margin line on an overweight basis. While there's opportunities in SG&A, we have more opportunities in cost of sales. And ladies and gentlemen, with that, we'll be concluding our question and answer session. I'd like to turn the conference back over to Ron Coughlin for any closing remarks. Thank you for your time and your questions. As we close, I want to reiterate that we're confident in our plan to navigate the current environment, and we remain resolute that we are well positioned to capture the long-term megatrends of the growing and resilient pet category. Thank you. That concludes Petco's second quarter 2023 earnings conference call. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, with that, we will conclude today's conference call and presentation. You may now disconnect your lines.